come a long way, baby. Started out hunting squirrels with squirrel dog, possums, finally coons, bears. We've come a long ways, 73 years. But dog hunting is a part of my life. Only my wife I love more. But I'm a dog hunter from my head to my boots. Where's Fielder? He's gone to the dogs. Folks, you're listening to the voice of Gary Knapp of Hurricane, West Virginia. Gary and I have been friends for a long time, and I'm going to ask him here in a minute if he remembers how far back our friendship goes, but I know it goes back to my UKC days. Gary, at one time when I was with the AKC, uh, wrote a series of stories for me uh, that I used on our website, and they were very popular. Gary is a funny guy. He's a guy that has a lot to say, and he was, in fact, a spokesman for the uh, West Virginia Bear Hunters Association, which is very uh, near and dear to my heart because my dad once served as the president of that organization. But uh, I want to—I just want you to greet uh, my audience, Gary. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and and your background a little bit, and then we're going to get into some good stories, I'm sure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name's Gary Knapp. <laughs> I was a spokesperson and a lobbyist for the West Virginia Sporting Dog Association, the West Virginia Coon Hunters Association, and the West Virginia Bear Hunters Association. And I had the honor of having the position of the president of the West Virginia Bear Hunters Association for several years. And like I told you in the opening, I'm a dog hunter. If you've been hunting with a dog, I've hunted. Everything in the state of West Virginia and Ohio that you can hunt with dogs, I've hunted. And I have been friends with Steve for a long time. He's a very knowledgeable dog man. Hmm. And he's given me a lot of information that helped me over the years in my lobbying pursuits. Well, Gary, I remember, uh, you know, when I first met you, and I think at that time you were hunting plot dogs or you were interested in plots or you had a good plot or had to somehow, I think, as I think back, it had something to do with a plot dog. Do you remember? Yeah, I do. Now, I've owned all kinds of dogs. I don't, I'm not colorblind. It don't make no difference to me what color they are for a good hound. But, yeah, I had to... Fortunate enough to own a good plot. My granddaughter was 10 at the time. She claimed him. Her name was Hannah. And her and that dog just as tough as each other. When you turn <laughs> him loose, he punched a hole in the dark. And the next time you see him, he's tree. Mm. She was the same way. <laughs> so uh, how old is Hannah now? Uh, about 27, I think. I see. They grow up fast, don't they? They do. Yeah. Well, listen, let's go back. You say that uh, you come from a long line of dog hunters. How far back can you trace that? My great, great, great grandfather, his name was John Knapp, he fought for the Union Army. And he was. Uh, Born and raised, which was at that time, was uh, Virginia, but here in Putnam County, West Virginia. But my family is all fox hunters back in them days. Didn't have much money, and you didn't have much for recreation. So dog hunting was something that you could do, but you had no radio or TV, internet, and all that stuff. So it was a cheap hobby to have. I asked my dad about dog food because I knew that was uh, something they had to have, but it was expensive. He said, oh, no. He said, my mom would make big pans of cornbread. She didn't put uh, baking powder in it, just cornmeal with cracklings, 
and then they milk cows. What people call one percent milk now is what they call blue john. Yeah, it's got everything took out of it. And uh, you take that cornbread and blue john, mix it up in the bowl for the dog. That's how they fed the fox. Animals. They weren't too much concerned about the protein and the fat content. <laughs> no, uh, uh, right. I can. They were just concerned about the price. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I certainly remember the stories my dad told about his mother cooking bread for the dogs. And I'm not so sure that a time or two, maybe back in the day when I was a kid, that there might have been some dog bread cooked at our house, too, when maybe it was between uh, paydays or, uh, or, you know, uh, a bag of dog food back then. I don't know what it cost, probably a couple dollars two or three i remember joy dog food there in west virginia you could get it in a plastic bag that you could see through the bag you could see the kibble was inside but uh, uh, anyway uh yeah that that was typical i think especially with foxhounds how many uh dogs do you think they kept at a time well my granddad's brother hershey he was a big fox hunter and my dad's brother, Denver, they kept about 40, 50 head of dogs all the time. Mm-hmm. Because you didn't have no tracking system. Every night you hunted, you had dogs lost for days or weeks. Yeah. That's one thing about fox hunting back then. You always had a dog lost. <laughs> yeah. I can remember going to Tennessee. You know, my dad's boyhood friend, Hubert Mike, um, had... Uh, uh, foxhounds and uh, I remember particularly I was real small and they're talking about this dog was left out he didn't come in to the horn and uh, they figured he was caught in a fence so and my uncle Elton Fuzzle uh, who married my dad's oldest sister he kept foxhounds and it might have been one of his but at any rate they had to walk fence lines and that you know all over looking for that dog in the fence i don't remember if they found him i don't know if he was in the fence but i'll always remember that thinking about that poor dog out there caught in the fence you know yeah years ago they was having a big ordeal about this training season i don't know i was probably in my 20s and uh, some of them i call them tree huggers whatever you want to call them <laughs> right uh, this woman was there, and she was complaining to the state. And they, she said that uh, these dogs was laying around her house all the time. They called the number. They wouldn't come and get them. Just on and on and on. And the man conducting the meeting was the uh, West Virginia DNR director. And I told him, I said, if you don't mind, I'll answer that question. He said, I'd be glad for you to. I stood up and I said, you know what? She said, what's that? I said, there's two things that I've got. My wife and my dog. I said, my wife don't come home. She knows how to get back. My dog don't come home. I worry about him. Yeah. That was the end of her conversation. (laughs) Yeah, they just don't understand, Gary, what these dogs mean to us. And uh, I think you and I both are a little bit long in the tooth. I know I'm older than you are. I'm pretty sure I am. Yeah, you are a little bit. But, uh, you know, and the older we get, the more that uh, becomes important to us. Uh, Well, the most important thing is for somebody, a young man or girl, to have the opportunity that I have. That's the main thing that I'm interested in. If they don't want to hunt, I don't care. But if they want to, I want them to be able to. Yeah. You know, I read something the other day on Facebook, so it must be true, right? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yes. No, but it was attributed to Hank Williams Jr. Now, I don't know whether he said this or not. I know a lot of celebrities get uh, um, accredited for things that they didn't really say, but they... Uh, whoever was trying to get the point across, if they thought they attached a 
a celebrity's name to it, it would carry more weight. But anyway, he may have, sounds like him. Uh, and he was just talking about all these things in, in, in society, that if you don't like it, if you don't believe in God, then that's your right. But don't, uh, I do, and, and I don't want you to bother me because I do. And exactly. go on down the list, name all the things you want. You want hunting, hunting with dogs, guns, um, whatever. Uh, my, the political party you choose, if you don't like my party, well, good. Don't be part of that party. Be a part of the other one. But, you know, just leave people alone. You know, I don't get it, and I'm, I'm going to get off the stump, but I don't get why people feel like that just because they don't like something or don't want to do something, they have to either stop me from doing it or create some kind of an obstacle, uh, you know, to, and you and I know, both know, having worked in the legislative field for many years, uh, that it's all about control. Do you agree? A hundred percent. I was standing when the West Virginia legislature was in. What they did, they, they, the game wardens and a judge interpreted the law that if my dog entered your property, I could be arrested via the dog, and they'd arrest me for trespassing. We had to get that law changed. So I got registered as a lobbyist and spent the entire session every day at the Capitol for two years because we didn't have the money to hire a professional lobbyist. So we finally got the, the law changed. So this good friend of mine, and he's a dog hunter, and he comes from a long dog hunting family, come up here one day and asked my wife, I said, we're here again. So he's back up there at the legislature. I said, what's he doing up there? And I said, he's trying to get this law trained, changed where your dogs won't be trespassing and you can still train dogs. He said, I don't know why he worries about this stuff. We've always been able to dog train and we'll always be able to. She said, Billy, I'm going to tell you something. Wasn't for Gary, you wouldn't be hunting right today. <laughs> so you have to take a stand. Yep. You have to do it. Yeah, and, uh, you know, a lot of people that are listening to this podcast every week, um, you know, they all they can think about is getting out there in the dark and turning that dog loose, and great, because my life has been wrapped around that, too. You know? Uh, but, Senator, yeah, go ahead. Senator Joe Manchin was running for governor at the time. And I told the bear hunters, king hunters, and the sporting dog association, I said, we've got to start getting involved in politics. So he was running for governor, and he'd been defeated at that once before. So they gave me permission. They voted on it, gave me permission to back him in the governor's race. So I went up there and met with him and some of his people. And this one guy, he said, you know, I, I just don't understand y'all. I said, really? He said, really? He said, um, y'all want to be able to hunt year-round, but you don't harvest animals year-round. I don't see the point in it. And I said, well, you know, it's just like this. I said, I noticed that you have on a golf shirt. You play golf? He said, we do. Or I do. I said, you know, I'm wanting to pass a law. And he said, really, what's that? I said, that you can't play golf during summer months when ground nesting birds are on their nest. Well, he said, that would run our golf. We wouldn't be able to practice. I said, well, then I think you see what we're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you just have to put it into perspective. Oh, yeah. That, that they can see something could damage them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Jesus taught in parables. I'm not a preacher now, and this is not a religious podcast per se, but, you know, he taught in parables because people understand stories, and sometimes you have to put it together in a story, in a, a word picture that people right. can grasp a hold of, you know. That is for sure. That's yeah. a, I'm a firm believer in parables. 
Yeah, for sure. There's one that comes to mind to me, but I think if I reca- uh, uh, give the account of it, it will be too obvious who I'm talking about, so I'm not going to do it. But while I was at KC, uh, we had a situation where uh, an individual I was asking for an individual to be barred for life because I thought the uh, the uh, crime that he committed, so to speak, <laughs> in the dog world, you know, was very egregious and uh, deserved the worst punishment we could give. And so I had, uh, here I am faced uh, with a group of uh, primarily New Yorkers <laughs> on the board of, of the American Kennel Club, and I had to put together a picture based on the world that they recognized and when I was able to do that to illustrate, because somebody asked me, why do we want to bar somebody for life? That's a long time. And so I had to paint this picture uh, in the realm of dog shows that they understood. You right. Know? And uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to go any further. But. Yeah. Well, Gary, I know that you were very good at your job. I know that you were successful. And, uh, you know, every time you and I've had a conversation, we it's been enjoyable to me because you always had some good stories to tell. In fact, we just talked on the phone here, I think, yesterday or day before for a little while. But yes. uh, when uh, let's let's roll back the, uh, the, the, the years a little bit. Look back there to uh, Putnam Putnam County, right? Yes. Uh, West Virginia. What was it like when you started out? What were the dogs like? And how did you guys go about hunting, whether it was coons or squirrels or whatever? Well, and, my dad was the first one to the family that I know of that had a dog other than a foxhound. They called them short game dogs. I never did see one, so I don't know what they look like, but they were small like a big one. Oh, okay. But they catch skunks and tree possums, because that's all we had. Yeah. They skinned the skunks and the possums. Yeah. But when I started, he bought a squirrel dog. I was probably eight years old. And, uh, man, I tell you what, I fell in love immediately. But an old man that lived across the road had a dairy farm. And he had two hounds, but they wasn't no coon. I mean, when I say none, I mean none. We did catch possums, yeah. put them in a cage, and feed them scraps. He called to clean them out, then he would kill them and eat them. Mm-hmm. So that was my second hunting experience, or I guess I, they kind of went together. But I mean, I'd, I'd go, as I got bigger, I'd go quail hunting with people and grouse hunting and that sort of thing. So then finally, we started getting a few raccoons. Now, I know you're not allowed to bring raccoons in and stock them, but there's no other way that they got here. These cane yes. clubs brought them in and turned them loose, and there's no doubt in my mind about that. Nope. But uh, we started getting canes, and it was, I'm telling you, people talk about a pup. A pup now is about three months old. Because the time he's six months old, he's running three. Him. Back in, a three-year-old dog was a pup. <laughs> because there wasn't no coons to three. They, yeah. We were the first coon that i ever seen up a tree. And I've hunted a long time. My dad had some relations that lived down in Mason County. He had a dairy farm. And I was probably 10 years old. Maybe 12. Well, all we had was a carbide light and a two cell flashlight and he'd tra- he dog traded he traded for each two dogs and they tree down on the creek the season was in he had a 22 pistol and a box of shells he shot every shell he had and no coon so he told me he said you stay here with them dogs I'm going back down there to my cousin's house and borrow a gun I was scared to stay up there by myself so I told him, I said, I'm not staying. I'm going with you. Instead of him tying the dogs up, he left the dogs loose. The time we went down and borrowed a gun, they'd left the tree and was on the fox. 
But that was the first coon I ever seen up a tree. Mm-mm. Well, you know that talking about stocking coons, I've got a lot of memories of that because our coon club there in Raleigh County, West Virginia, uh, you know, would would get coons. We started out getting them out of Pennsylvania, and they worked real good. Uh, they adapted well, and our biggest problem was get uh, keeping the guys from killing them to where they yeah. could grow up and breed and so forth. You know, that's right. And <laughs> there was a deal like. These guys actually thought, uh, and I don't want to disparage too much our fellow West Virginians, but some of those old boys out of the holler and all, they figured if they had a membership card to the club, they got a coon that they could go turn loose. (laughs) Well, the unfortunate thing about that was it might have been a good training session for their dog. But it wasn't doing a thing to help replenish the raccoon or stock raccoons because that coon probably never saw the sun come up the next morning. I agree. I agree. (laughs) So we had to go into a committee system kind of with our directors, and they would distribute the coons and wouldn't tell anybody where they were turning them loose. But, um, yeah. I'll tell you something about stocking coons that I found out accidentally. I got a pretty good size farm. It's 285 acres. And we don't live on it. Mm-hmm. Well, matter of fact, and I've given it to my grandson here in the past couple of years. But anyway, it's been in my family since the Civil War. That went out to people with names other than Naps, but they were the girls that had got married, you know. But anyway, my you. granddad bought it back, and my dad, and then I let my grandson out. But anyway... My wife and I went out there and had feeders up. As a matter of fact, I had that pluck dog at the time, RJ, and uh, my granddaughter, my grandson. Somebody caught a coon in a cage and gave it to me. Well, there's no electric out there, but I have a camp. We got turned that coon loose right in the yard, and it got dark. And I started hearing this noise outside of screaming, crying, squalling. And my wife said, what is that? I said, I don't have an idea. I've never heard it before. <laughs> well, I had a three fifty seven Smith & Weston laying there on the table. I got it in the light and went out there. And this coon was up there in the yard running around hard and carrying on. He went up a tree there. <laughs> I thought, well, that's the end of him. So I went back to lay down and he started up again. So anyway, I studied about it. He was exactly where I'd turned him loose. I think he backtracked himself as far as he could go to go home, and he couldn't go no further because there was no more tracks, and he was lost, and he was crying because he was lost. It wasn't no baby king. It was a good-sized king. So my granddaughter and my grandson and I, we talked about it, and I told him, I said, now now when we turn these kings loose, we're going to do a little experiment. I got me some spray paint, like you spray logs with. Mm -hmm. And I sprayed the first one. I remember I sprayed his tail orange and took him right down there at the feeder and turned him loose. Well, a night or two later, we back up there hunting. We tree right there on the feeder, and there's a coon with an orange tail. So I thought, well, that's pretty well confident to me what's going on, but we'll try it again on another feeder. We had feeders all over the farm. We sprayed one with green fluorescent paint, and sure enough, it was the same way. So the key to keeping a coon when you turn him loose, when you turn him loose in Raleigh County or Boone County, which I've hunted all that area, and it's (laughs) rough and steep, when you turn him loose in a little hollow and you think he's going to stay in that hollow, if ain't nothing for him to eat, he ain't going to stay in there. Correct. But if you turn him loose and there's a feeder there, He'll backtrack himself to that feeder, and he'll be there till some son of a gun kills him that shouldn't be in there anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, they're going to go with the feed, you know, <laughs> where where they can uh, survive. They're not they're not dumb. Uh, I learned that years ago, you know, hunting in Raleigh County. We would look at the mast crop, and for those of you who are not familiar with that word, that's the crop of nuts and berries and so forth that comes every fall that the wildlife depends on. 
And if we didn't have any mast or we didn't have any acorns or beech or whatever, they'd move out and they'd sure. go somewhere else. You know, I remember somebody telling, maybe we can Google this and look it up and all. One time years ago, way back, there was a massive squirrel migration in Tennessee. And maybe it has happened since, I don't know. But squirrels were seen by the hundreds moving. You know. We had the same thing here in West Virginia. There was a crop, mass crop failure. When you go through Charleston, West Virginia, on the interstate, there's a concrete divider. There is no grass medium. Mm -hmm. And it looked like a squirrel truck had wrecked up through there and throwed squirrels up dead everywhere. I've never seen so many. My grandson and I, at the same time, were hunting down on the high, or fishing down on the high river. And, uh, we were down there fishing, and there was dead squirrels floating in the water. I told him, I said, I can't figure this out. And he said, look out there, Granddad. Now, I swear to you, there were squirrels swimming the Ohio River. Now, their tail would be above the water a little bit at the top, and their nose, the rest of them was under. So when a barge would come by or a speedboat would come by, it drowned the squirrels. But they were actually swimming the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. I saw it with my own eyes. Yeah. Well, and how do they know where to go? I don't know. Well, maybe just driving by. I don't by. know either. Uh -huh. but, I have no idea. Uh, nature's going to take care of itself, and if it overpopulates, you know, then often the result is, is cruel. You know, it's it's harsh. Uh, you well, know. there's lots of corn on the other side of the river. Yeah. I don't, I'm not telling you they can smell that corn across that river, or maybe you just got to go somewhere. I don't know what, but... <laughs> They were sure headed that away. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. Really is. You know, when I was a kid, if there was a gray squirrel in Raleigh County, he was on my hit list. <laughs> and, and man, I, I would not give up till I got him. And now I got a yard full of them out here. I wish somebody would come come and thin them out for me. You know, here in Florida they're everywhere. You know, oh, it used to be a big thing here in West Virginia, squirrel hunting the opening day of mm -hmm. season. Absolutely. My dad owned a farm at the time. My wife and I hadn't been married too awful long. She hunts the same as I do. Now, she ain't much of a dog hunter, but, right. coon hunt, or, but deer hunting or squirrel hunting she likes yeah. because she was set. Mm -hmm. But I had a 63 GMC truck, regular cab. My dad was up front. And my wife was in the middle. Pulled up her to my dad's farm, and we don't know where to park. The driveway was full. Cars everywhere. Poster signs everywhere. I pull up her and I said, how you guys doing? Uh, I said, getting ready to go squirrel hunting. But there ain't room for you all. I said, who owns this place? He said, uh, which is said on the poster. So he signed it. He said, Dayton Knapp owns it. I said, do you know him? Oh, he said, yes, sir, we've been friends for years. <laughs> I said, you don't seem to recognize him. He's sitting here in the truck with me. He said, get him out of here, boys. Get the trucks out. Aren't y'all going to let us hunt? I said, no, I'm not going to let you hunt. I already know you're a liar. <laughs> yeah, we're our own worst enemy sometimes, you know. And hunters, uh, you got to have permission. The guy owns that land. He pays the taxes. I don't believe that you got receipts of where you paid. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about those guys sitting there. Uh, on your on your farm, uh, right. they don't have any tax receipts for that place. And uh, well, if they'd ask my dad, he'd let them hunt. Yeah, well, he didn't he say did. they couldn't hunt. I was the one who said they couldn't hunt because <laughs> they made me mad. But oh, yeah. uh, he wasn't he wasn't too particular about who hunted, but he liked them to ask. Well, you know that was the thing back in in Raleigh County. You know, if you took. It was hard to get a guy a guy to guide to his spot on a night hunt because uh, if he took a night hunt cast in there on Saturday night, by Tuesday night he'd have to get an appointment to get back in yep. there to to hunt on his own place. You know, that and, is the truth. I've and, experienced it myself. And you know, I've had farmers come and and say, or tell us. You know, my dad and me. He said, "Well, so and so came, and they said they." came up here and they hunted with you and they were your friend and 
and all that and could they hunt and I said well if you're a friend of home and fielder or yeah you know I'll let you hunt well we didn't know him from Adam's house cat you know right uh, yep. but uh, that's no good that's the kind of ethics that gets us in trouble um, of course the antis like to use this word ethical hunting you know well uh, hunting's just I used to be I used to be a little bit out of control, I guess, when I was young. At least my wife says I was. <laughs> but the uh, same experience, this boy I know, he was young. His dad and me is pretty good friends. And I took him to this spot one night, and I told him before we went over. I said, I'm going to take you to my best spot, but I don't want you to ever go back there. His dad said that we won't be back and he told that boy, he said, I don't want you back over here now. I said, okay, Dad. He's about 18, 16, somewhere in there. Two or three nights later, I went over and there said his truck in my spot, nowhere for me to park it. Well, the state here used to cut brush along the road with a brush axe. It'd be real sharp on the end. I found me something one about the size of a broom handle and ran through the grill into the radiator. And left him sitting there. I didn't fuss or argue with him about hunting in my spot, but I never did see his truck back in there. <laughs> extreme circumstances require extreme measures sometimes. It does sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they all say, and we used to say that'll break that dog from sucking eggs, right? <laughs> well, you know, a lot of those remedies w- will work, you know, uh, they won't necessarily be. Uh, approved by the local magistrate, <laughs> but no, it but, wouldn't be, and but, I wouldn't do that now. But yeah, back then I just was a little more hyper than I am now. My wife says I ain't calmed down much, but I yeah. have tried to do better. Well, I've I've heard the stories hasn't happened to me, and I try to always have permission if I go. That's the biggest problem I have here in Florida is finding a place to go. You know, and. Uh, but there's been a lot of guys walk back to their truck and then found a, a a big old spider web right in the middle of their windshield, you know, right <laughs> where somebody took a ball bat to it or whatever. But uh, well, you know, people amaze me, Steve. I, now, this these are good guys that I'm talking about. Now, one of them was a preacher, and the other one was a deacon in the church. Mm. Over at Logan, I was over working. We was putting a drag line, a shovel, and some. 170 ton trucks together. I was over for about, I don't know, two years or three years working. And these guys were talking to me and they said, that, of course, I didn't have time to coon hunt then. I was working uh, six days, most of the time seven days, but I was working 16, 18 hours a day and I just couldn't hunt mm-hmm. and staying over in a motel. They asked me, said, uh, you ain't going to know where over a guy can go coon hunting, do you? I said, yeah, I got a farm. I said, would you love us hunt? I said, yeah, I'll let you go over and go hunting. I said, it ain't an open invitation. I said, you know, if you go with me, you're welcome. I said, okay. My boy was, I don't know, 10 or 12 at the time, maybe. They come over here, an old geek with a dog box in the back. And it's way before dark. I said, we want to get out there and look around some before it gets dark. I said, okay. We drove out there and pulled out in the hay field. Uh, keep in mind, they didn't have plastic bottle pop. Back then, they had little throwaway bottles. Mm-hmm. And they said, we drove around, looked around for a while, and they said, well, so we better have a little picnic before it gets dark here. And I said, okay. They'd open up a bottle of pop and give my boy one, me one. They'd drink it, throw it right down on the ground, right behind the truck. Eat a sandwich, throw the paper down. Mm-hmm. Eat a candy bar, throw the papers down. It was a dump. And I'm trying to think of a nice way to tell them that I, we can't do this, you know? Yeah. So I'm studying about what to say to them. And I said, well, boys, it's getting dark. And we better get our mess cleaned up. So what do you mean? I said, well, these bottles here, when Dad Moses, hey, it'll cut his tractor car. We can't leave bottles laying around this. We can't leave this paper here. It'll go up in the baler. Said, well, I'll be there going. Said, you know, we noticed they ain't junk stuff thrown out over here like he is over home. 
In other words, they didn't think he was doing anything wrong. They didn't even know they'd done anything wrong. Yeah. Well, I but used you got to take care of a man's place oh, when you're on yeah. it better than you do your own. Well, I'm fa- a fanatic about that sort of thing, and I guess the people who have worked with me over the years know that I could drive them crazy over the details. But I always thought it was the little things that made the difference, you know. But uh, I would tell people on those pretty farms that I hunted in in Michigan, I said, nothing that you brought in here is going to stay here. If you brought it in, you're going to carry it back out. I don't care if it's a cigarette butt or whatever it is. You're not going to leave anything here. If the gate's open, you leave it open. If the gate's closed, you close it back behind you, going and coming. I I agree. That's the way it's got to be. And uh, if you can't abide by that, then, you know, we'll, uh, we'll just... We won't be able to go hunting. But, uh, I'll you tell got, you another important yeah. thing that I think about dealing with a landowner is offering them some of the game. Mm. Uh, when I, I hunted with some men, they quite quail hunt. They had dogs when I was young. And they'd always do that. Yeah. When we get ready to leave, they'd go up at the house, knock on the door, and have six birds or four or whatever and offer it to them. Now, lots of times they wouldn't take it. Yes. But it made them feel good that you were willing to share with them because they were actually their birds as far as I'm concerned. They was on their property. Yeah, I can remember many times my dad had asked, you know, would you, you know, uh, we'll say we, we're going rabbit hunting. Uh, you, you know, would you like a couple of rabbits for supper? You know, and all sure. if we get any, we'll, uh, and of course we'd just, you know, field dress them and, and, uh, and take them and. And offering, like you say, some would take them and some wouldn't, but the offering was was the important part, you know. Yeah. Well, it, people, I don't understand how they think. I was out there working, building fence right along the road, and this guy, I knew who he was. His mother had died, and she always allowed me to hunt, coon hunt. But he wasn't very friendly. You could pass there and wave, and he'd turn his back to you. So I didn't want to aggravate him. So he stops there, and I'm building a fence. And he said, I've seen you around. What is your name? I told him. He said, my name's such and such. And I said, yeah, I know who you are. I said, you live over on Spring Branch. I said, your mother or grandmother, whatever she was, you slow me coon hunt over. He didn't say nothing. He said, I'll tell you what, I saw the biggest buck I ever saw in my life standing right there in your meadow the other day. Of course, bow season was in. And he said, if I was afraid you wouldn't have got mad, I'd have killed it. I said, well, I don't know. I probably wouldn't have got mad. I said, it'd be awful hard for me to drive by and see one standing like that. Oh, he said, it's the biggest buck I ever seen in my life. I said, well... Like I say, if you see him again there, and I'm not giving you permission to go around and tromp around, but if he's that close to the road, you want to shoot him, that's up to you. He's man, I appreciate it. I said, while we're on the subject, I said, how about uh, letting me coon hunt over on you? Oh, he said, no, it had to be after December. I said, what's the reasoning for that? Oh, he said, you'll run my deers out of there. I said, but my dogs don't run deers. Oh, he said, if a dog goes in there and barks, some deers will leave. Well, there's no use arguing with anybody. They ain't got no more sense than that. <laughs> he said, but after December, when the muzzleloading season and everything's out, yeah, you coon hunt them. I said, well, the weather's usually so bad by then that I don't want coon hunt. But I tell you what, I don't think I want you killing no deer here on me. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're liable to wound it, and it'll run down there around one of my coon feeders and scare my coons. I said, he's liable to run them clear out of here. <laughs> he just drove off, and I was just as mad as he was when he left. <laughs> yeah, they just don't get it, do you? I, Ella and I have a little saying, or she hears, it would be me more than her. She hears me say this a long time over somebody like that. Uh, I mean, she would hear me say this regularly. I'd say, well, it's his world, and we're just living in it. 
you know. Well, that's, and yeah, some that's people it. are like that. Well, they know. are. Oh, yeah. We used to have an old boy back there in Raleigh County. He'd pull up a posted sign, and he'd say, boys, this is a good vicinity. He didn't say vicinity. He said vicinity. He said there won't be nobody else hunting here. Uh, cause must have post, been my wife's nephew. <laughs> it must have been my wife's nephew. That's the way he operated. Then there was he'd a boy. He'd a poster sign. He knows it's a good place to hunt. Yeah, that's old boy up in uh, I'd mentioned his name a hundred pe- uh, people listening to this podcast would recognize it, but he'd say, uh, uh, we'd pull up to a place and there'd be posted signs everywhere on night hunt. And he said, boys, this is, those are welcome coon hunter signs. It, uh, it just says low light zone. So keep your <laughs> lights. <down." laughs> and I, oh my goodness. Mm. But you know what? We're we're kind of joking around and we're telling these stories and all, but it, it's a major problem for a coon yes. hunter anywhere in the country is to have a good place, a safe place with ample ground to and habitat to run a dog and have any fun with it. And if they don't believe that. Yeah, and how many the, people under the sound of my voice here today own enough property to do that with regularity? Right they right have to depend on someone else to, from the goodness of their hearts to let them go onto that property and hunt. And if they can't appreciate that, I don't know how they were raised. They weren't raised by parents like mine. No, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing, though. I mean, even on public land, and we do have a good bit of public land here in West Virginia, but they don't want you hunting on public land. Yeah. Uh, I had a turkey hunter one time. I wasn't involved with it, but he called me because I was the president of the Bear Hunter Association, and he's complaining about these guys, he's calling a turkey and their dogs in you know, the summer, spring or whatever. It might have been the fall, I don't know. But he's calling a turkey and this pack of dogs went through running, scared his turkey. And he's raising cane with me. I said, but where did this happen at? He told me. I was trying to figure out who it could have been. And of course, there wasn't nothing I could do about it. And he said, I said, you talking about the National Forest up there? He said, yeah, yeah, that's where it's at. I said, you do realize that that is public means for everybody. He said, yeah, but you can't even turkey hunt for them guys running them dogs around. I said, well, I know that's upsetting, and I appreciate the concern you have about it. But how many bears do you think I've had killed when my dog was running and some guy was sitting on a stump and shot that bear in front of my dog? Mm-hmm. I said, I don't want to raise heck carry on with him. Right. I don't like it. But that's the way it is. It's public land. Well, somebody printed some t-shirts I thought were kind of cool. It said, public land owner. <laughs> that's know? nice. And we're yeah. all public land owners. That's why I get a lot of people contact me about this White River National Wildlife Refuge in Arkansas because I've talked about it a good bit and I've got a fair amount of criticism from some guys over the years for talking about it. They say, we don't want all these hunters out here. We've hunted this for years. We had it to ourselves. We don't. I said, whoa, 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 man. That is a national wildlife refuge. It's everybody's refuge, you know, and they have regulations at times of year that you can go and you can hunt and what you can can do. And, you know, there are rules, but it belongs to all of us. It's not mine. And if I can, if I have a good time out there and I can tell somebody else about it and they can go and take their kids and they can have a good time or their buddies can get together like we do for a week and eat way too much and tell way too many lies, uh, then everybody should be entitled to do that. And I believe that. I don't believe that uh, I, I should be selfish about something just because I happen to know about it and somebody else doesn't. That doesn't make me any more entitled than they are. So right. well, there's an old guy. There's a guy out there. He's He's been out there ever since uh, 
I've been going, and my buddy nothing more knows him. And he's just a real negative guy. Anytime you talk to him, it's it it's gloom and doom, and you know the. This year ain't no coons, too many hunters, or yada, 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 yada. You know, just an old sourpuss, you know. <laughs> and I said, no, man. I mean, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, that thing of taking care of the places you got to hunt is really, really important. What are some of the things you remember um, about your days as a lobbyist? Uh, um, and some of the things that you were able to accomplish there in, in West Virginia, Gary? Well, this law about our dogs trespassing, we all went to a professional lobbyist, and I met him up there, and he was a lobbyist for Philip Morris, Budweiser, beer, some cigar companies, two or three whiskey companies. And he said, uh, I want you to come over to the Marriott tonight, and I'm going to talk to you and introduce you to some senators and stuff, try to help you a little bit. I said, okay, I appreciate it. So I go over there, and they have two rooms joining each other. One was like the sleep in or whatever, and the other was set up and all this stuff. I mean, whiskey, beer, cigarettes, cigars everywhere, stacks of them. Get what you want. Take them home with you. Well, after the meeting was over, or died down some, I was talking to him, and I said, you know what this law is that we're wanting to get passed? It's just to change, it's just to define it, that they can't have us arrested for our dogs getting on somebody's property. And he said, yeah, it's not too complicated. I said, well, how much would it cost us to hire you to get this law passed? He said, $20,000. Well, as you know, it's hard to come up with twenty thousand dollars. Yep. So we had no choice but to become a law. I had no choice but to become a lobbyist or forget it, and that's the end of dog hunting. Um, going through these meetings and committees and all that stuff, they knew nothing about dog hunting. You know, they said, "Well, we got to have a number. Like if your dog gets on this guy's property five times, then he got to get arrested." How about that? I said, "Well." If a boy's got a rabbit dog and it's making a circle, it can be five times in one day. <laughs> it can't be done. So, you know, it was yeah. it was really a struggle. It was hard on me physically and mentally to be up there every day. And it boils down to let's make a deal. Mm -hmm. Everything is let's make a deal. Can't you? Yeah. I mean, bear hunters and coon hunters, maybe a whole world, I don't know. They thought you could just write this down on a piece of paper and hand it to them, and they'd read it and they'd vote on it, and that'd be it. You got to get it to the East Committee. If that committee chairman don't want it, she just throws it in the trash, or he throws it in the trash, and that's the end of it for this year. So, the yep. coon hunters and the bear hunters and the sporting dog association. Started, we uh, introduced this, got it introduced, and I started having them call up to the Capitol at the legislature to say that they were in favor of this bill. I can't remember this woman's name. She was from down in Wyoming County. She was the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. And the second day that this was going on, she called me on the phone. And she said, Gary, we've got your point. Get them to quit. Now, we didn't have Facebook and all this stuff. You had to call everybody. So yeah. I'd call President of Coon Club. And I, my wife, she started timing. It took me 20 minutes per call, and I called hundreds of calls to get people to call. And she said, we've got our phone lines jammed up. You've got the whole thing shut down. So everybody's calling about this dog law. And we got the point. We're going to run it through the city. So that was the first year or the second year, and it didn't make it to the finance committee then. So you had to go through the same thing with every committee and all this stuff. And finally, it was the last day of session, and it hadn't been put on the docket. 
was down there on the Senate floor. This guy that worked there asked me, he said, I see you here a lot. What's this all about? I was telling him, he said, oh my gosh. He said, I rabbit hunt. I knew nothing about this. I said, well, this is the thing. He said, it'll be on the docket today. How he got it on there, I don't know, but they, it voted and passed. So that was the end of it. Mm-hmm. But it wore me out. If you ain't got somebody to help you, get it. Yeah. We're getting a little bit of uh, fading in and out on the phone today, Gary, and uh, I, I don't know what's going on, but point's well taken, brother. I mean, I did that type of work in Michigan for several years, and I've had Mike Thorman, who's with the Michigan Hunting Dog Federation, also represents several of the hound hunting groups there in Michigan uh, on the podcast before, and we've talked about this, but this lobbying effort, it has to be done. And I, I, there's an old saying that stuck with me. Uh, I don't know whether it came to me in the, in the middle of the night or I heard somebody else say it, but every time there is a city council meeting, a county commission meeting, a legislative hearing meeting at the state or national level, there's the possibility of somebody standing up and proposing something that's going to put us out of business. Exactly. And so the only way to prevent that is to be vigilant. It's kind of like the old farmer watching the hen house, you know, for the fox. We've got to be (laughs) vigilant. And listeners, if you live in a state that does not have a state watchdog group, a, a group for organizing the hound hunters in your state, you need to be the guy that starts one. And if you do have one in your state, you need to join it and support it. And if you've got the gift of gab like Gary and me, you need to be uh, raising your hand to say, I'll go to the state capitol and I'll fill out a little card to get my two minutes of fame to stand up and talk the hounds. What hunters, dog hunters and all hunters have to realize whether they want to admit it or don't admit it, it's just the way it is. Imagine that our sport is a big rock. It's huge. It's like a pyramid over in Egypt. But they're just taking one chip out of it at a time. Yeah. Every time they take a chip, pretty soon that pyramid's going to fall down. And that's yeah. their, the way they operate. And they're not truthful about stuff. I mean, oh, I've no. been in meetings and they'd say, well, uh, we understand that you bear hunters go to the butcher shop where they slaughter cattle and buy buckets of blood to feed your dogs. <laughs> I mean, just really asinine statements that have no, I'm not wanting to chase a bear. I mean, a cow or a pig. I'm wanting to chase a bear. Boy, so many of those things come to mind, Gary. I probably should just write a book about it, and it would be like a Ripley's Believe It or Not of the things that I've seen. But one of them that I saw when I was a young man living in Beckley uh, there, and my dad was with the Bear Hunters Association. Of course, I was always a member. But they, uh, the, the Charleston Gazette and all you may remember those days, they started this Save Our Bears campaign in West Virginia. Oh, yeah. Had the school kids wearing badges, you know, and all this stuff. And a state senator, and you may have been part of this, I don't know, but uh, stood up in the state house in Charleston. And and by the way, we got one of the most beautiful capitals in the whole United States right there on the banks of the the Canal River. I used to, uh, I graduated college there at what used to be Morris Harvey University right across the river. But at any rate, he stood up in the, in the session and, and told the story of how he witnessed hunters driving four-wheel drive vehicles with dogs in pursuit, chasing a bear cub through the mountains of West Virginia and chased that poor little cub until it could just barely make it up a tree, and it was hanging by one paw on a limb up there dangling, 
until it finally its strength was gone and it fell into that pack of snarling, snapping dogs. Surely you don't think a politician in this country would lie. <laughs> Driving a four-wheel drive through the mountains chasing a bear. You might get a glimpse of him when he crossed the road somewhere, but you ain't going to be far. But anyway, that's just an example of an extreme example of the kind of deceit. And, uh, you know, the people that want to take our sport away, uh, they're evil. (laughs) If they can tell a lie to advance their cause— then that I no was problem. in a meeting with the led it was the legislature up there, the natural resources committee, and they brought in this woman and I she was famous. I won't say no more than that because I don't want to have another confrontation with her. But she stood up there and she said, It is a proven fact that a man that'll whip a dog will beat his wife and kids. And looked at me and said, You ever whip a dog? I said, I have. She said, there you go. I said, lady, I'm going to tell you something. You don't know my wife. She <laughs> said, no, I don't. I said, well, I ain't whipped her because if they would, she'd have busted a cap on me. <laughs> uh, tell me that the other day you mentioned something about a dog and a wife. What was that little story you told me about? Oh, my dad, he always told me, he said, what well, about this me? He says, if a man's lucky in his lifetime, He'll have one good dog and one good woman. Well, I've had to revise that. I've had two good dogs and one good woman. <laughs> I used to have one good dog, but I got in bad trouble for saying it. So now I say I had two good dogs and one good woman. <laughs> I've been married to her for 53 years, so something worked yeah, pretty good. Something working just right, buddy. Her God dad was you. a fox hunter, and he yeah. liked it. She, she knew what it was to like to hunt, so that eased it some, I guess. Yeah, those you know, foxhounds, we owe a lot. Those of us who enjoy tree dogs owe a lot to those that uh, that hunted fox because that's kind of where it started in this country, yeah. you know, by those foxhounds being brought over and imported. And we talk about George Washington and, and these people, you know, that had foxhounds early on. But, uh, you know, our, our tree dog stock came out of those foxhound They packs. did, but yeah. and, uh, this young man that lives at Sam Black Church here in West Virginia, yeah. named Joe Donaldson, he's a real good young man. About three years ago, he called me. He's got walker dogs. He said, I've been studying about this. And I'm wanting to put some more speed in my dogs. He said, what do you think about breeding to a foxhound? I said, Joe, they all come from foxhounds at one time. <laughs> he got in touch with some guy out in Indiana or Illinois that won the world, the national championship of foxhound and bred one of his females. They come out real good, and he's made this cross two or three times. Now, he's got some blazing walker dogs, I can tell you that. They still got the tree power, but they got the speed now. Well, there you go. You know, we were just talking about this on the podcast. In fact, the one, I think, the week uh, that aired before this one, uh, Gary, and talking about mixing foxhound into to some of the bear dog packs. And, uh, you know, uh, and I mentioned, uh, you know, there's a breeder out in Oregon, Mike Kemp, that's been very successful with that. And I've seen it in the, the dogs that I hunt with over in Virginia when I go bear hunting up with uh, with the group up there. But uh, this and, and Troy Hoffman, who was our guest last week, mentioned that it was he uh, had a trig female and uh, no, 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 a July female that he bred uh, to a plot and produce some really good dogs, and they've been uh, breed, family breeding on that line uh, since, and they're using them for bear dogs and coyote dogs. So, yeah, that uh, that speed is, uh, uh, but uh, speed kills, <laughs> as they say, but you got to This is have... one thing that I'd like to make a point to anybody that 
breeding dogs or thinking about breeding dogs. In my lifetime, they bred the horns off cows. All cows had horns unless you cut them off. Mm -hmm. In my lifetime, they bred the horns off. Now, they have come so far with these dogs since I was a boy. Nobody had a dog that would hunt. It walked with you. Mm-hmm. Every dog we had walked. Huh? To have a dog six months old, running and treeing on its own, turn it loose, it punches a hole in the dark. Was I'm telling you what, this selective breeding has made our sport better all the time. I like a good dog. I don't care what color he is. But I tell you what, it's amazing to me how far these dogs have come in such a short period of time. Yeah, and you know, there's a lot, right now, there's a lot of talk, a lot of controversy, and a lot of it comes from old guys like me that are just (laughs) too old to follow a a wide hunting dog anymore. But, uh, you know, as to whether the dogs were better back then or better now and all, I can say unequivocally, I think I screwed that word up, but I got most of it. That sounds good. I know what you mean. I got most of it in there anyway. That West Virginia accent. I threw myself into a coffin fit on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, there's no doubt that the dogs are better nowadays than they were when I was a kid growing up. I think the dogs, you know, they started later. They were probably more accurate than a lot of dogs that I see nowadays. Uh, But um, as far as just what you cited there, starting early, uh, you know, we, uh, my buddy uh, Keston Jesse over in Lebanon, Virginia, won a puppy on a raffle uh, on the, on the internet. And, uh, that pup is, I guess he's about six months old now. That is a hunting fool. I mean, he'll turn him loose with his two-year-old, who is a wide hunting dog, and he'll go about 600 yards with that dog, and then he'll veer off and go another six on his own somewhere. Right. You know, and he's six months old, you know, so. I yeah. like a dog with a hunt. I ain't able to mm-hmm. go like I used to be, but when I turn one loose, I don't want to see him no more until I get him off the tree. Yeah. Well, I think we're all that way. We don't like to see him coming back. Um, back in the day, you know, when I was a kid, we'd turn them up a big, long hollow there in southern West Virginia, and, and we want them to hunt that hollow out. And, if, and usually they'd strike and go up over the side, and we'd have to climb out to them. Right. But uh, but if there wasn't anything stirring, they'd hunt that hollow out and eventually come back. But uh, nowadays, there's no comeback button on most of these dogs today. Well, there's a lot of coons. They don't have to go very far to, to tree one yeah. like we used to be. Yeah, that's for sure. I remember the first year that I killed 50 coons in a season. Mm. And I was out of the service and married, I remember that much. And hunted three nights a week is a big deal to kill 50 coons in this country. Oh, yeah. Well, you're in the part of the country, for just a point of reference for my listeners, is that you're uh, going west out of Charleston toward Huntington. Uh, you're probably, what, a third of the way to Huntington from Charleston? Yeah, a little, maybe, maybe a, a close to half. Yeah. Hurricane West Virginia. Yeah. Hurricane, yeah. Uh, Milton is around there fairly close to. Yeah, that's it? the next exit below. We're going toward yeah, Huntington. Exactly. So you're more in, I won't say flatland. You've got hills, but they're not the steep stuff like I grew up in. No, no, it's not Raleigh. like we're, it's not like that. Yeah. Are you not very, where you have to wear hobnail shoes to climb them. <laughs> that's right. Used to always kid us about having one leg shorter than the other one, you know, so you go around those hills. I'll tell you what, you need it. How far are you from the Kanawha River or the Little Kanawha? In the Kanawha River, I'm about uh, 20 minutes, and it's about 20 minutes. We fish there a lot, fish in Ohio a lot. Yeah. 
Well, it, it's interesting to me because I've kind of, I had a cabin there in in the western part of North Carolina, and uh, where the New River heads, and there's a north and a south uh, f- uh, fork there, and it heads there in North Carolina and, and flows northward, you know, up through yes. North Carolina, Virginia, and into West Virginia, and it kind of eventually empties into the Kanawha River. Actually, their gully bridge, the mm-hmm. gully river and the new river join and it becomes right. the canal. Correct. Yes. The river makes yeah. the canal. And then the canal flows there to about Point Pleasant or so is where it empties into the Ohio River. Is that right? Correct. Yes, that's yeah. correct. And, of course, the Ohio goes on over to the mighty Mississippi. I used to live just across the river. Uh, of the Mississippi in Charleston, Missouri, for one year when I started school uh, because my dad was working out there. And uh, where the Ohio empties into the Mississippi. And then when we go to the White River out of Alabama, crossing over from Mississippi over into Arkansas, we cross that big Mississippi River. I've always been fascinated by those stories, you know, of the of the rivers and. Uh, uh, I was too young to remember all these details, but I do remember it. Near Winfield, West Virginia, mm-hmm. there's a powerhouse there by the name of John Amos Power. Plant. Yes, there you was can a see family it from '64. Yes. Yeah. There was a family that owned that by the name of Morgan. And it's Mr. Morgan. Now, I don't know what years these were, but a long time ago. He built a steam boat. And he was a taxidermist. He left right there at John Amos Powerhouse on this boat that he built. And he had a couple of guys with him. And they went clear to New Orleans. And he would, like, in his little museum, he had uh, an alligator snapping turtle, which is huge, you know, it's bigger than a big war stub, and birds and all this stuff that he had collected on his trip. I always thought that I'd like to make that trip, but I never did get it done. Right. Yeah. Well, I used to read the stories uh, by Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain, you know, about the rivers. and uh, Right. And then there's coon hunters. Uh, Tam Young, a black and tan breeder out there, you know, was a, 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 a tugboat captain for many years on the rivers out there, and his son Clay is a captain too. And I always think of those guys when I see those boats pushing those long barges, you know. One on thing John, that, that Mark Twain said that I, my wife and I say it to each other quite frequently, We'll cross the river and be real muddy. Mark Twain said the Mississippi River was too thin to plow and too thick to drink. <laughs> too thin to plow, huh? And too yeah, thick, too to, thick drink. to drink. <laughs> well, I'm reading I read a lot of novels, uh, westerns. I like western novels. And I was reading one about these guys taking these steamboats up the Missouri, the big muddy, they call it, you know, up. Uh, and, and I think about the days of Lewis and Clark, how they, you know, they went all the way across the country. <laughs> and and now we, we can't find our way back to the truck without a GPS. They walked all the way across the con- the country and, and found each other. They split yep. up and they got back together. I'm like, how? They didn't how, lose a man. How in the world did they do that? That's hard to believe. It is. It's been a great visit with you today, Gary, and I absolutely well, I've enjoyed it. Well, I hope so, and I definitely want to get you back on here because you've got a lot of stories. We we kind of got off on the legislative end of things, oh, and, all, that's, and okay. that's and that's good because that's a message that we've got to tell. If we're not going to tell it, who is? You know, we've got to convince people to come in out of the woods. Join their state, local clubs, organizations, whether it's NRA or the Sportsman's Alliance. or uh, But on your level, in your state, you need to be 
a, a number that can a name that can be counted, that can be added to a list. That when a Gary Knapp goes before the legislature, he can say, "I represent X number of houndsmen in the state of West Virginia, and and uh, these are their names, and we're against this or we're for this." You know, in right. the years in Michigan, there were so many instances of things that we were able to accomplish. Uh, we saved the use of uh, recovery collars up there, tracking collars. Um, we beat down a recreational trespass law that would have been detrimental to us. We defeated Proposition D that would have stopped bear hunting over bait and over and with hounds. So it can be done. The record's clear, but it's not easy, and it takes no, everybody, not. doesn't it? Can't sit back and sit on your hands and think it ain't going to happen to me because it's going to happen to you. Well, I think there's a lot of people in this country, and I'm not going to get into politics on this podcast, but I think everybody knows where I stand. You know, we've got some serious problems in this country, and if we sit around and say, well, I hope it'll change, it'll never change. So we got to stand up for what we believe, whatever it is, you stand up for it. I- I'll be glad. <laughs> Glad to tell you what I believe. If you want to, oh, call I will me, be. But... I, I'm not ashamed of what I am or what I believe in. My wife and I like to watch baseball, and our team is the Atlanta Braves. We go down there quite frequently and watch them play. Well, Atlanta was playing Cincinnati the other day, so she wanted to go. My hero is Alvin York, Sergeant Battle York. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I have a campaign hat. A lot of people call them Montana Peaks. Yep. I have one that I wear, especially if I'm out in the sun. Mm-hmm. So me and her at this ball game, this young man sitting sat behind me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Sir, you in the Marine Corps? I said, no, I wasn't. If I said, Major Hat, I thought you were in the Marine Corps. I said, No, I was in the Navy, buddy. I looked, and here he stands with a can of beer. I won't go into what brand it was, but I'm sure you know. And he says, I said, buddy, you're making me extremely nervous. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he said, he's in the Marine Corps. I said, you're making me extremely nervous. He said, what do you mean? I said, a Marine drinking that? Oh, he said, man, don't go there. I said, I'm already there. I'm telling you. (laughs) Well, he said, the line up there for the regular beer was real long, but this line was real short, so we got this brand. Yeah. I said, I don't care what brand it is. I, a Marine drinking that don't go together, and it makes me extremely nervous. <laughs> so he gets up, he gets up there and comes back with a Uligan or whatever it was, and he said, this make you feel any better? I said, it makes me feel a little safer. <laughs> My wife sat there and she says, Gary, you're not 21 years old no more. <laughs> That's right. She said, they're going to stretch you one of these days. Yeah. I said, baby, let me tell you something. You don't stand up for something. You stand up for nothing. Yeah. I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. Yeah, we you are, You want Gary. me to him, tell him about his blue can? I'm sorry. He shouldn't have been drinking it in the first place. <laughs> Well, Gary, it's been great, buddy, and I'm going to have, I told you we'd do about an hour, and we've gone almost an hour 15 here, and I want you to be thinking of some of those stories you used to share with me when on the phone and when you were All writing. All right, yeah, your, I can, your I mute. can tell what I was can go that? on for days. Yeah, yeah, what was that, what we call them, mule tails or something? Was yeah, that? mule tails, that's yeah. what everybody called me when I worked in the mines, they called me mule. yeah. And he's got a million of them, folks, and I'm going to get him back so we can share them. The guy asked me one time, should I come and call you mule? I said, because a mule can pull more and work harder than a big horse. <laughs> I believe in working hard. Yeah. I want to give a man a day's work for a day's pay. Yeah. You know, we. I, I just can't help us. i got to go here. We're talking all the time, my wife and I. We just, you know, we just talk a lot, and that's great, and I recommend it for any marriage. But uh, we're talking about, you know, how uh, kids just don't get the idea that hard work is important and it's rewarding. 
you know, if we could just portray on the, to, to young people today that there's a lot of rewards in doing a job well, even though you might be tired and even may, though it may have been hard, the reward you get out of it. You know, when I was a kid and I got a job, I couldn't believe it, man. I had a paper route. But the first real job I had was working in a supermarket, and they gave me a white apron to wear, and they gave me a time card to punch. And when I went in and when I, uh, when I left, and they paid me $1 an hour. That was the minimum wage when right. I was in high school. Okay. And my job was to bag groceries. Okay. And we had these big carts back then because you carried everybody's groceries out to the car. And sure. you had a big bin like on the top of it where you could put several uh, bags, brown paper bags of groceries in that top part. And then you had a tray on the bottom if they had bigger items, you know, that you could lay down there. I would take the groceries out and uh, and run back in. I'd push that cart and I'd run. You had to go up a little hill like to the front door. Of course, it had the power doors. And they said, Phil, what are you doing running back in, man? Take it easy, man. I said, man, i got to go, got to go. There's another load waiting on me. Sure. I was always driven like that. <laughs> and, Gary, I tell you, I don't know why. Uh, my dad, I knew, was a hardworking man. Uh, my grandpa was a coal miner on Cabin Creek and, uh, you know, and all that. But hard work when I hurt you folks and doing something, uh, you know, uh, uh, our pastor has a saying, if I could remember it <laughs> right here. It's something about doing the hard work of the good work, you know. A and the good work that we do in life is hard sometimes, but it's worth it. And the work that you've done to try to preser preserve our right to free cast towns, especially in the great state of West Virginia, is very, very much appreciated by me, Butter. Buddy. I appreciate you. You've done a lot to help me. You know, it's just people, you can't wait till a kid gets 18 years old and expect him to go to work when he's laid in his room for 18 years playing video games. That's right. My grandson, we was coon hunting one night. He's about 15, maybe. And he's texting. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm texting. I said, you're supposed to be listening to them dogs. He said, well, uh, my girlfriend texted me, and I'm just saying, I said, I don't care. <laughs> Leave that stuff in the truck. Hey, he man. said, um, when you and Momo was young, said, uh, did you text her? I said, baby, we didn't have phones. <laughs> she didn't have electric in her house. That's right. I couldn't text her. <laughs> so he said, how'd you communicate with her? I said, well, like we'd be in school, we'd in a one room school. I'd write her a note, and hand it to a kid, and they'd hand it to a kid and give it to her. <laughs> he said, Really? I said, Yes. Have they allowed you to do that? I said, Oh, no. <laughs> I said, He said, You ever get caught? I said, Yeah, I can remember one time. I said, What happened? I said, The teacher confiscated the note, looked to see who it was from and who it was to, called me up, said, I want you to read this to the class. I said, Barbara, you're the prettiest girl I ever saw. <laughs> he started dying laughing. He said, that's all he was to the note. I said, yeah, that was all he was to it. You had to read it to the class? Was you embarrassed? I said, sure. <laughs> he said, was, and I said, you're the prettiest girl on Big Scary. That's where she lived at. And he said, was she the prettiest girl on Big Scary? I said, oh, yeah, by far. But I said, baby, Big Scary ain't a very big place. <laughs> oh, boy, that's right. Well, Gary Knapp, you've been a great guest, and I'm so uh, glad that you came I appreciate on. it. Yeah, brother, and uh, you you keep it uh, keep things under control down there in the, in the old home state or up there in the old home state for me, and I'll be calling you again pretty soon, okay? All right, mate. Thank you. You bet. Folks, goodbye. Mr. Gary, Na goodbye, Gary. From Hurricane, it's not Hurricane, it's Hurricane. 
West Virginia. Longtime friend, a great guest. Folks, that's going to do it. I'm going to uh, once again thank my good friends, uh, Buddy Woodbury, Jason Duby, all the staff out at W Hunting Supply for making this podcast possible. If you need anything in the line of hunting gear for you or your hounds, they're the ones that you need to see. DU supply.com all right we're gonna uh, call the dogs and you know what we do to the fire uh, it's uh, time to to say goodbye for this week and if anybody asks you where Steve Fielder these days just tell them why <laughs> he's gone to the dogs we'll be right back.